I just know you're going to love the guests that we have on in this episode, so don't go away. Welcome to another episode of The Interview. I'm Dr. Rick Wodge. We have a dear friend of the studio of ITVN. That is Dennis McKinley with Western World Missions. That's correct. Dennis, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Rick. God it's good to see you. You have quite the range of background. Yeah. And so why don't you share with the viewers a little bit about yourself? Oh, wow. Well, uh, I, uh, I got saved in 1975. Uh, and I was... Uh, uh, rodeoing professionally uh, at the time and uh, God began to just do uh, some awesome things in my life uh, at that time uh, uh, proving himself real on on the rodeo circuit I, I uh, roped calves I didn't ride Bronx and bulls yeah. uh, but I, I was a calf roper and uh, <clears throat> anyway and then uh, about the same time uh, there uh, this uh, Christian cowboy movement started in, in the United States uh, two two different organizations. What do you think in the seventies? Actually, they, these two ministries started in 1973, a okay. couple of years before I was uh, born again. Mm -hmm. And uh, one was uh, the Fellowship of Christian uh, Athletes, the Cowboy Chapter. Uh, there was a group of cowboys, professional cowboys, got together that year, and, and they wanted to do something Christian-like. They didn't know what to do, so they talked to Tom Landry, coach of the sure. Dallas Cowboys, right. about uh, what they wanted to do. And he said, which he had started the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Tom Landry had. And so he uh, welcomed the Cowboys to the FCA, and they had a separate uh, organization called the Cowboy Chapter of that. So they, these men started that. At the same time, <clears throat> God had raised up a man by the name of Glenn Smith, who uh, his organization was called uh, Rodeo Cowboy Ministries. And uh, he was the guy that God sent to the professional rodeo cowboys to minister God's word. The FCC, the, uh, the Fellowship of Christian Cowboys, basically it was just a fellowship. They'd have a big fellowship meeting at Denver in the wintertime. They'd have another one at Cheyenne, Wyoming, and the big rodeo in the summertime. And they had two things really in common. They were Christians and they were cowboys. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the thing was, the, the Fellowship of Christian Cowboys, though, of athletes, whatever you want to call them, they did not want anything to do with preachers. <laughs> they didn't want a preacher coming along and and taking over their organization or whatever. They didn't need preachers. So they basically their their ministry was it was uh, testimonies and just fellowship. And when Glenn came along, they didn't really want anything to do with him. And uh, <clears throat> but uh, and God used me. A lot of the guys that formed the Fellowship of Christian Cowboys were friends of mine, competitors, and so I knew most of them. And and then I, but I had gotten to know and meet Glenn Smith and his wife Ann, and uh, so we. Uh, we were friends, and I so I God used me to to bring them together to re them to realize that Glenn wasn't trying to take over anything. He was just God had sent him, and so uh, <clears throat> it was it was it was a it was a good meeting together, and and uh, so the 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 this cowboy Christian cowboy movement that now there are there are literally cowboy churches all over mm -hmm. the united states yes. and even all in different parts of the world now mm -hmm. but it all started i would say the biggest part of it started with glenn uh because he was ministering god's word and the word of faith to us he uh, uh, uh john osteen who joel osteen's dad was yeah. was a good friend of glenn smith's uh john osteen made all of his teaching tapes available to glenn to distribute to all of us cowboys out there with rodeo professionally and also uh glenn was a personal friend of kenneth copeland's and and kenneth made materials available also to us so we we were getting all this good material to read and stuff and uh so it was a, it was a it was a great thing the this this christian cowboy movement it's started at the rodeos the big rodeos around where they would have, we would have a church service and uh, and then out of that after a period of years these these uh, a lot of these cowboys that were ranchers farmers and ranchers that were out competing but they went home went home well then they wanted to do something at home mm -hmm. so they they started arranging some camp meetings in their local 
uh, area. And so then it branched out into s these camp meetings. We was having these camp meetings. And then, and then out of that, then, the, then uh, somebody else in the church, they want to do something. So it just continued. You know, God's, the word says God will build his church. And so it was just multiplying tremendously. And then all of these rodeo cowboys, there were so many getting saved and everything. Then they had these rodeo schools, roping schools, team roping schools. And so all of these world champions that had given their life to the Lord, they were having these schools and also giving an altar call at their schools and stuff. And so these kids, their families are, are coming and get, coming to the Lord. So it is just, uh, it's just grown exponentially. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, God built a testimony in my life uh, competing, and uh, he so blessed my life. Um, he made himself real to me as a competitor, and I hadn't won a whole lot before I knew the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> But after I had come to know the Lord, the Lord gave me such a peace that I began to function and use the God's give, gifts that God had given me. And as a result, I won or placed at all the major rodeos across the United States. And it was really fun. It was an exciting time. Uh, at that time, right at that time, I don't remember, but uh, the, probably the number one song in the country was uh, Rhinestone Cowboy oh, by Glenn Campbell. Of course. Well, that's my song. I mean, that was my song. Song. I mean, I'm I'm riding out in Star Spangled Rodeo, and I'm winning, and you know, <laughs> places, you know, all over the country. It's a, it was a, it was an exciting time, and God was making Himself very real to me, and okay. so yeah. And I knew I had a call on my life, though. So, uh, when when I came to know the Lord, a young, <clears throat> I had searched. When I was in Vietnam, I was a Vietnam veteran, and while I was over there, I was searching. I took catechism from an army chaplain. And was was sprinkled as a cat, baptized as a Catholic, and I, at the time I told the he was an army chaplain. I said, Father, I don't understand it. I don't know. I can't do my rosary, and I don't know the stations of rites. Right, all righty, I'll he sprinkle me anyway. And so I tell people that <clears throat> what what Roman Catholicism taught me, uh, and it and it's a denomination, Roman Catholicism. You know, uh, I said what it taught me was that I couldn't live it hmm. because I wasn't regenerated. I, I'm, I said I was like the pig. I kept going back to the walla, or the dog returns to his vomit. And, and so I wasn't regenerated. I was trying, but I came home and uh, started living my life, went to college. Uh, <clears throat> and life wasn't turning out the way I wanted it to. There were some disappointments. So I was really searching and uh, got out on my knees in a little apartment I was living in at the time. And I said, God, I want to give you my life. And I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and I don't think you even want me. <laughs> but I want to give me my life. And uh, just a peace came over me. And that's what I was searching for. I was searching for peace. And this is around 1975? 1975. Okay. I was 30 years old. And uh, it's mean, amazing, you know, so many people, their, their lives, I, mean, I talked to lots of people, their lives turn around when they're 30. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus started his ministry when he's 30. You know, so that's a kind of a, most, most men don't know what they're going to do until they're 30. You know, and, it's true. Uh, you know. And then really don't have the resources the wisdom to pull it off until they're in their 40s. <laughs> sure, yeah. Put it together in their 30s to 40s. <laughs> right. And, and they have great yeah. hindsight in their 50s and 60s. So yeah. it just takes time. Yeah. Yeah. And I was searching. So I was searching. And I was rodeoing. I started. I did, I made up my mind that I was going to. I wanted to rodeo and, and, and professionally. I had some. I, I went to the college national finals and rodeo. And I'd, I had... Uh, became a professional or a member of the professional rodeo cowboys association but i had never won anything in any big rodeos or anything and and uh and after that with that meeting with the lord that night and i still didn't know the plan of salvation mm -hmm. but i just god just i i just got in my spirit that everything was going to be all right i Somehow didn't know you how since his presence no, I don't even know that I sense his presence. Just a peace came over me. After just, just that prayer, God, I want to give you my life. And I just, I didn't know anything. Uh, it was a little while later that uh, I was at a rodeo at Tulsa and young man at a Bible booth there, they had an exhibit hall and this young guy, he, he asked me, what do you have to do to go to heaven? And I said, well, you know, basically, you know, the, the, what, what religion says, be a good guy you know, appease God. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm telling, giving him my, you know, how good I am. I'm, I know I'm not. You know, I had my theology when I was a little boy. This is what I believed when I was a little boy. I believed 
that all kids were going to hell mm -hmm. and all adults were going to heaven. That's what I believed. And I couldn't wait to get grown up so I wouldn't go to hell. So you'd have a chance. <laughs> yeah, and the reason, I guess, is because I knew I was a rotten little sucker. and 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 uh, But that was what I thought. But anyway, uh, so this young man, uh, he questioned me, what do you have to do to go to heaven? And I and I was already, he said, well, you won't. He was honest with it. He said, well, you won't make it. And I said, oh, yeah. And I started arguing with him. Oh, yeah, I will. That's what I've always heard. You know, grandfather theology. Sure. And he shared one scripture with me that the scales fell off my eyes. And I realized that uh, it was so true. But the scripture that he shared with me was Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, which was the same word that God, the Holy Spirit, gave to uh, Martin Luther. And it says, For by grace are you saved mm -hmm. through faith. It is a gift of God and not of works, lest mm -hmm. any man boast. Mm -hmm. And when, I, when I, he shared that with me, and the revelation went off that salvation was a gift. I couldn't pay for it. Mm -hmm. It was a gift. I had to receive it as in any gift. Yes. And salvation came right then. And uh, because there I was boasting, <laughs> you know, it says not a work lest any man boast. And at that time, Rick, I knew what I was going to do the rest of my life. No one had ever shared that simple gospel truth with me, that salvation is a gift. Jesus said basically two things concerning salvation. He said, repent, mm -hmm. or just turn around and believe the good news. That's all he said. Mm -hmm. Repent and believe the good news. Mm -hmm. What's the good news? That God took all my bad and he gave me all his good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I, the guilt left, you know, when the sins stack up, you know, in your life, I was a slave to sin, right. you know, I, you know, but they stack up and you, how do you get rid of it? How do you get rid of that guilt and that shame right. and whatever? Well, it left. And, uh, and then I knew I was going to share that same simple gospel with as many people as I could for the rest of my life. So I knew I had a call in my life. I don't believe ever, I never considered myself to be a great preacher or anything. I don't believe that Billy Graham was a great preacher, but he had a message and he stayed with that focus on that same simple message. And there was an anointing. Yes. And it was the anointing that spoke to people. Yeah. You know, Dennis, I, I'm sure this is the same story with you. Over 20 years of preaching in my own congregation, other people's congregations, friends' congregations. I can't tell you how many times somebody would talk to me, preacher, you know, pastor, mm -hmm. after the service and say, boy, it was great when you said dot, 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 and I'd never said those words. So I think it's yeah. God that really does the main speaking, not the preacher, not the teacher, not the evangelist. It's the Spirit of God, the anointing of God. The Holy Spirit empowers us. And that's what it says in, you know, in, in Acts chapter 1 and 2. Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Well, you, you just mentioned before any of you that I was, uh, <clears throat> was going to have a problem because I was kind of an introvert. <laughs> okay. I'm beginning to change my mind on that, though. <laughs> well, but that's what the Holy Spirit does because right. through high school and also college, I absolutely, if I had to give a speech, I would hyperventilate. I could not talk in front of people. I would choose a subject that I knew a lot about and try and get through it. I was actually going to go to college another year just to take some speech classes. But guess what? Guess what? In 1977, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they, and they can't shut me up. Mm -hmm. You know, God empowered me to, to share and stuff. And I am really... Uh, out of this, you know, as well as I do, there's so many ministers and preachers. They think, oh, man, that guy's so gregarious. He's outgoing and everything. But that's really not him. Right. That's the anointing you're there. But me, I am pretty much of an introvert if I'm just off by myself. I'm not. That's I'm right. always at a church service. I'm always. I don't want to sit up on the front row. I want to sit in the back row, you know. And uh, But uh, God empowers us. And and so I was uh, out of that. And, and I God God blessed me. I learned to live by faith, rodeoing, all over the country. God blessed me, and it was in the 70s, 1976, 77, 78. Mm -hmm. Those three years, I rodeoed full-time, didn't have a checking account, didn't have a credit card, and I went on what I won. And God, time after time after time, God would bless me, and I had enough to get to the next place and so on. And, uh, and in 1980, I was ordained <clears throat> church in California. Uh, we had mentioned, talked about mm -hmm. Southwest Believers Fellowship that uh, uh, 
there in Bakersfield. It was a great church. They saw the work that I was doing out there, and, and so they ordained me. And, and, uh, and I've been preaching the gospel ever since, uh, rodeos and missions and, and things like that, uh, on, you know, around the around not only here in this country, but I've had roping schools in, in uh, Panama. I was in Panama uh, two weeks after they removed Noriega, and mm -hmm. I had, went there and had a roping school. I, I thought them Panamanians would probably stone me when I gave the pre presented the gospel and gave an you know an altar call. But these were students of mine at my roping school, and uh, out of uh, 32 students that were there, were that were all professional people. They were. Uh, doctors and businessmen and lawyers and so on because they were the only ones that had the financial means to do that down there. Out of 32 of those students, uh, 20 of them came, 28 came to the Lord. Wow. And, and then I had, you know, of course I had a, a large ministry and, and that's still gone going uh, in, in Australia. We went to Australia in 1981, Glenn Smith and I with Rodeo Cowboy Ministries. We went over there and had church services at this uh, big, it was called the World Cup Rodeo. And out of that, this tremendous move of God started in Australia. And it was before, uh, what's the big uh, church in Australia? Yes. I, I just had it on the tip of my Brian, tongue, too. Brian, whatever it is, mm -hmm. just, uh, they, they have the songs. Uh, they sing. Oh, of course. Uh, but that was all before this. That hadn't even started. You could see these monstrous Darlene churches. Darlene Sheck was, is the main yeah, she, person who was behind all that. She, sang, she yeah. was a song leader. And yes. uh, Brian Houston, and that is named the pastor of the... That sounds of the, right. Uh, Hillsong. Hillsong, that's it. Hillsong. Yes. That, this was before that. This yes. was before all that. Yes. Kenneth Copeland was having some meetings mm -hmm. over there and stuff. But basically, our move, what we did, having those church services every day at that big rodeo in Melbourne and then in, and then in uh, Sydney for a month, all these Australian cowboys came to the Lord. Hmm. Uh, there in, in uh, the red light district of Sydney called King's Cross. Uh, we were in a hotel there, and there's a swimming pool up over the street outdoors. I baptized over 30 Australian cowboys and cowgirls there, and the move is continuing. It's just there's people that have been preaching the gospel over there in the outback for 30 years now, and it's just continued to grow, and cowboy churches over there. And When you talk about 30 years, I mean, this is really a recent, a very recent movement. Sure. And as you say, it's gone around the world. Yeah, yeah. Who would have thought? Yeah. I mean, I can see in Texas and California and Idaho places that, you know, they're cowboys, active sure. cowboys and ranches, but Australia, of course, yeah. there are cowboys in Australia. Right. Yeah. You know, and also in Mexico, any, you know, the, Will Rogers made the statement, the whole world wanted to be a cowboy. And uh, I go places in the world and I'm wearing a hat and they all say, oh, you're from Texas. No, I could be from Nebraska, but everybody thinks, thinks of, you know, the, the, everybody knows. I, mm -hmm. I, I've got this little uh, track that I wrote, the American Cowboy. And in it, I state this, that, that uh, the American Cowboy is the most enduring, best known figure to come on the scene of world history in the last 200 years. There's no other figure mm -hmm. that if you've got a hat on, they know exactly what their trail drives, cowboys, westerns. I mean, mm -hmm. I asked a, uh, an African preacher one time from Uganda. He wanted me to come to Africa, and I hadn't gone, but he asked me uh, if I would come. And I said, well, did, did they know about cowboys in, in, in Africa? He said, oh, yeah, we've watched Gene Autry and Roy Rogers forever, you know. And uh, so, yeah, there's a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that every, that's going on. And now, you know, when I first went into ministry in 1980 and started preaching at rodeos all over the country in California and had church services at, uh, at the, uh, <clears throat> what's the stadium where the Lakers play? What do they call it? Uh, mm -hmm. it's the, uh, it was something else at the time. But I had church service there. They had, used to have a big rush, Staples Center. That was what yes. it was now. Yes. But it was something else at that time there at Inglewood. And they, have, they used to have a pro rodeo there. And I had church service there. And I had church service at Salinas, the big rodeo at Salinas and, and Reno and, and all of those places, uh, San Francisco at the Cow Palace Rodeo. And uh, it just, uh, it's grown uh, so much. I used to, I could go anywhere I wanted to at a, at, a, at a horse event or a rodeo or a stock show and have a church service. But that's, that's not true now. There, you, when, if I was to go to any horse event, any, any stock show or rodeo, uh, whatever it may be, uh, somebody is there having a church service. Somebody is there. There is a ministry really? there already. Yeah. You, you used to, I mean, you know, it is absolutely phenomenal. And that is, you know, this, uh, 
uh, team roping, which is a huge event now. They they have our, we have the national finals rodeos in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's the biggest event in, in Nevada in Las Vegas now. Used, it wasn't when it started in '85, mm-hmm. but now after 30 years, uh, it is the biggest event. And the purse there at the national finals rodeo is uh, I think it's over 10 million dollars now. But at the same time, the World Series team roping uh, event is going on at the same time mm-hmm. over at South Point Casino. And their purse at that team roping is $12 million wow. just at this team roping finals. And so this, all of this stuff has just grown exponentially. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Now, it started as a grassroots movement. Mm-hmm. Has it become very corporate now? Uh, <clears throat> I think there's... Uh, well, I know for one thing, the, the, in the, there's certain denominations that have gotten really gotten behind it. For example, in Texas, uh, a lot of the, you know, what the, the, the grassroots of it was basically pretty charismatic mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, non-denominational, I would say. But, sure. <clears throat> for example, in the state of Texas, Several years ago, the the the, Bap, the Texas Baptist Association, which is kind of over all the Baptist Southern Southern Baptist churches in Texas, uh, they got behind this, and they have they have established cowboy churches all over the state of Texas. You can go through any little town, and there's a cowboy church there, and most of the time they're they're under that umbrella, the Baptist Association. Not always, but a lot of them, and and they're not really necessarily cowboy church churches, but that's what they're calling themselves. And I think the reason that one of the things that a lot of them do, they'll have an arena adjacent to the church, and that's the bait. The people, they'll have play days, and they'll have, you bring your horse and we'll come with team rope sure. and do all these different things on the side, and that draws people there. Uh, there's also just the, with the fact that they call them cowboy churches, there's a, there's a freedom. They feel like there's a freedom. They don't have to dress, wear a suit, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, come in very casual, you know, and uh, yeah, and, and a lot of them are pastored by cowboys or have a cowboy history, and so they'll share stories about the ranching and you know whatever and kind of and so people, a lot of people are drawn to that, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's a continuing, you know, uh, continuing thing. Uh, Let me ask you, mm-hmm. you know, I've been I've been dying to to ask you this question. No, you've account- been living to ask me this question. I have been. I have been living to ask you this question. Uh, and thank you very much for the correction. When it, when it comes to the cowboy movement, if you were to look at, you know, what do you see as being the biggest challenge facing the cowboy church today and in the near future? What would that be? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know if it's necessarily true now, but it has been. And this thing that's uh, this territorial thing, you know, it, and it's the same. It's not it's, it's not any different than churches in, in any no. city in town. Right. It's this territorial thing. It's it's what I call it. It's the it's the fixed pie uh, theology. This pie is only so big. Mm-hmm. And and if and if you're and, and so we only get so much out of this. And so. See, most of the churches in towns and cities and stuff, it isn't so much they have a theological difference. It's it's the financial thing with a lot of them. It's like if you're if you're taking my people over there, then I'm going to have less here instead of and believing God to make the pie bigger. It's big enough for everybody, and it's kind of been the same thing with these cowboy ministries. It's been over the years. It's been ter- very territorial. This is my play. Hey, I preached here, you know, whatever, and you, you know, this is my deal. And that was never a, a problem with me. I went to Reno when I established the, the church services at Reno, a lot, one of the largest rodeos in the country, and I turned it over to another fellow and. And uh, he did it for a few years. Well, then he asked me, he was, wasn't going to be there. He asked me to come back out this number of years ago. So I get back, I go out there, and then they, there was another ministry that, that was there and everything. And I said, well, we can minister together, I think. I've never really made it a big deal to take up an offering or anything. That just wasn't my thing. I was usually ministering to people and forgot all about it. Somebody would get up in the crowd and say, hey, we need to take up an offering for, yeah. for Dennis and his ministry. Uh, just live by faith. It's wonderful to learn to live by faith, Rick. I mean, praise God. Uh, it was a great lesson for me rodeoing first and then 
And then when I went into ministry, I, God would bless me at a certain place and everything, but it was just enough to get to the next place yes. <laughs> and pay my bills. And I just, give, give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. Thank you that you supply all my need. And uh, but but so I, at the end they took this offering up and this one guy he was going to divide it up and everything. I said no, brother here you have mine. I don't. I, I'm going to sow that seed here. You know they were shocked. You know that I was going to give. I came there had expenses and everything. I wasn't going to take anything. But it, it's been territorial and I don't. It's it's still that way in some some ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, and it, and it keeps not like I say not necessarily theological differences and theology basically we we believe that uh, we're saved by grace and you know Jesus is the only way to heaven mm -hmm. uh but then there's some other things that sometimes enter in and that's the I think the financial part of it sometimes you know they're afraid oh he's getting more than he should <laughs> God has worked through you in a great way you've accomplished so much for him not for you and I appreciate that humble heart that you have. I see that very contrite spirit, a humble, gentle nature in you, Dennis. And I appreciate that. Um, I, I well, want that you. always to be a mark of ITVN. Well, thank you. And uh, But if you were to look in the future, what are your goals? What do you see taking place? Well, one of the things I want, I want to write some books. Uh, about my and I've got to do it. I'm getting older, and I, I've got to get this uh, get this book writing on because if I don't share this, it'll be gone. Mm -hmm. My life and what God's done and all the miracles I carried a 12 foot cross around the country and different places in the world for a period of time, just being an advertiser for Jesus. All these exciting things that God allowed me to do, and I want to put it in a book and my, or books. And uh, that's one of the things I, I want to do and uh, get that done and. Uh, yeah, and I'm still competing. I'm still. I, God allowed me after 20 years to start competing again, and I won. <clears throat> uh, started going to senior pro rodeos. They're like senior golf, and I've won uh, seven world championships, roping calves. And I'm, you know, I'm in my 70s now, and I'm still. Hey, God's blessed my body. <laughs> I'm healthy, and you know, uh, it's been great. Yeah, God is good. He is. I God is good. Uh, what would be the last thing you would want to put? Tell people before you leave the show today yeah. uh, to encourage them. Rick, I would I would say this that uh, you know Jesus came to save, seek, and save the lost, and that's the reason for all creation. And, and my statement to the viewers would be that today is the day of salvation. We're not promised it tomorrow. And I've asked so many people over the years. I've led a lot of people to the Lord just one on one. And I've asked. I I, I would say now after I shared with them. Uh, the way of salvation. No one, no one shared that with me for so long. You know, and Jesus said in Mark, I mean in Acts chapter four, that uh, <clears throat> there is no other name given under heaven among men that whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter fourteen, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me or by me." So Jesus is the way. <clears throat> and I would, I so would ask people, can you give me one reason, one reason? And you, they're watching this. Can you give me one reason? Think of one thing, one reason why you wouldn't want to receive Jesus as your Savior, a home in heaven, forgiven of your sins, uh, why you wouldn't want to do that today. Can you give me one reason why you wouldn't want to do that? Mm -hmm. And so many times, somebody, no, I can't think of it. I said, well, let's pray. And that's so cool. that's simply it. Uh, ask Jesus to be your Savior and, uh, and believe He heard you. And, uh, and then disciple yourself. Get, get in a church or get you a Bible and start, start reading that Bible. And, uh, Dennis McKinley, it's very good to see you again. You're a dear friend. And thank you, uh, just thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. And please come back. You have a lot more stories to tell us. And, uh, and we want to hear from the people will be blessed through it. Thank you so much for watching the interview. Thank you for being a part of ITVN. And we so appreciate all that God is doing in and through you. And uh, we pray that you have a great week. We'll see you next time on the interview. God bless. Shalom, shalom.